listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. As always, I've got a real treat and today's guest is going to be no exception. Now, just a bit of housekeeping, guys. We are coming up to our 50th episode and the theme for our 50th episode is 50 guitar teaching tips from 50 guitar teachers. If you want to be featured on the podcast, then submit your tip via the link wherever you're listening to this podcast. But let's get into it today with our special guest. So our guest today is someone who... I just can't get away from with their online Facebook ads. So I thought wanting to network with guitar teachers is obviously something doing somebody doing some really wonderful things. And I checked out his resources, his YouTube channels, his social media. And not only is he an experienced teacher with some really prestigious uh, positions, he's a great player and he's creating some really interesting resources. So I thought I'd get him on the podcast. Let's welcome Alex Rockwell. Alex, thanks for coming on the Top Music Guitar Podcast. Sure. Thank you for having me. Now, can you give the listeners and myself a brief overview of your story so far and how you transitioned from being a student and a guitarist to teaching at a university and now as you find yourself an online teacher creating products? Sure. Uh, so, after I, uh, after I finished my master's degree, I was pretty much immediately brought back into the university as, as an adjunct professor. Uh, I was teaching classes like intro to music, which is just like music appreciation for non-music majors, kind of a rite of passage for new professors, you know, everyone has to do their time. Uh, and I was teaching a bit of guitar. I was running guitar ensemble. I was teaching music tech. And I did that for two and a half years. I graduated 2017 and fall, yeah, fall 2019 was my last semester doing that. And at some point during all of that, I, I, I also acquired a full-time job in addition to teaching. Uh, I was working at this tech company. It was like a tech startup, just like a customer service role, just for, you know, just to have enough money to live on, right? And because the company was growing so much, I was getting promoted all the time and I was getting benefits and it was, it was really good. And But my last semester teaching that fall 2019... I was covering for my former professor who was on sabbatical that semester. So I was teaching all the guitar majors, grad students included, and still doing this other job. And it completely broke me. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of work across, the, um, across both, um, both jobs, just tons of commutes and never saw my wife, who was my fiance at the time. And we lived together. You know, it was just... And I wasn't playing. I wasn't playing guitar at all, you know, uh, outside of what I had to do for teaching. And so it just got to the point where something had to go. And because the other job gave me benefits, I had to give up the teaching job. And, you know, I wasn't thrilled about it. But uh, and then so things were nice and relaxed for about three months. And then March 2020, we all know what happened. And then that other job was no more. The CEO just pulled the plug on the entire company and everyone was let go. So I was unemployed for most of 2020. And this online teaching thing is kind of how I picked up the pieces. I, it, was, there was, it was a long year of trying to figure out what I was going to do with myself. And I ended up teaching myself a lot of new skills, you know, from marketing and like understanding social media tools and things. And pretty much built this whole thing I've got now from the ground up. And it's just been going up and up since this. It, I pretty much, yeah, I started it uh, January 2021. That was when I posted my first video that, that kicked me off, you know. And 
it's been going great. This is what I do now. Yeah, that's fantastic to go from obviously an overabundance of, of work opportunities to absolutely nothing as many people found themselves in that position to bouncing back and reinventing yourself and creating this online business. It's absolutely fantastic. So right now, is it safe to assume you do a mix of uh, like guitar lessons and creating resources and, and sort of selling your, your products? Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So for a bit, I was I was doing just the videos, the lesson videos and teaching privately over Zoom mainly, right? And, it, you know, there were times when I would just have like a bunch of students just like, you know, drop off all at once, you know, and it was just kind of like a financial blow, you know, and I realized that there is a need to diversify your revenue stream if you are doing this kind of thing. Well, I don't know if it's a need, but it's a it's a good idea. I should I would I should say. And at one point, I well, I'm still doing it, but I had this idea to do like a kind of a subscription based online course kind of thing, you know, and where you know I've got all these people who are watching my lesson videos I put on Facebook and YouTube and everything. And I, and I advertise that I teach, but the vast majority of the people who watch my stuff would never take a lesson with me, you know, for whatever reason, maybe they don't feel the need or maybe, maybe it's just financially not in the cards for them, you know, cause I mean, lessons aren't cheap. Right. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's a way I can monetize my wider audience, you know, and draw some more revenue in from them that way. So having this sort of lower cost subscription based thing with all these, you know, big courses of all kinds of videos on different topics in sequence, you know, would be a great way to do that. And I've had plans for it for a long time, but then I, I massively underestimated how huge of an undertaking that is. Um, so I'm still working on it on and off, but, um, but the exercise book thing, uh, that's, that's what really kicked things off, you know, for like having other revenue besides just the teaching. It's actually gotten to a point where it's like eclipsed the money I make from teaching. It's like, it's been way more successful than I ever thought it could be, but I've been leaning into it because of that. So that's awesome. Can you tell our listeners, uh, maybe just walk us through the contents or in terms of the, the exercise books you have created and, and what you are offering? Yeah. So they don't, none of them really contain much in the way of instruction. They're not exactly method books or anything like that. They're, they're more ways that I, in a way, I kind of write them for myself. You know, they're a way, they're a way to, they're a way that, there are ways that I think about structuring my own practice of fundamental things, you know, scales, arpeggios, chord voicings, all these things, you know. So the one that really, kind of got the ball rolling is is that book Morning Coffee, right? Which is the one that you have seen the ad for a gazillion times at this point, right? And Morning Coffee is is a really it's a really simple book in it in what it contains. It's it's it just goes through a whole bunch of things. Like if you're gonna do any kind of scale arpeggio stuff in your in your daily practice but you don't really know like what to what specifically you should focus on this like just going through this book is like a, a, it covers a lot of bases you know that would be that would be good good to work on so i mean it goes through like just ma two octave major scales it does like major triad arpeggios major pentatonic minor pentatonic scales uh minor arpeggios and then the big thing is like playing major scales and in broken intervals so it does like major scale and broken thirds, fourths, fifths, all the way up through tenths. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, seventh chord arpeggios at the end of the book. And the whole thing is like 78 pages. It, goes, it does all of that in every key, and which I think is important. You should practice in all keys, right? And I sold the book for $5. It's PDF. I think part of the reason it's so uh, successful is, be, is because of that is because it's it's such a low barrier to entry but it's all really basic stuff you know i mean it's not i'm not i'm not reinventing the wheel here you know it's just it's it's organizing basic stuff 
in like a concise, clear way. And it's all, and it's got all, it's well notated too. I mean, it's got the standard notation. It's got tablature with it. It's got all my preferred left-hand fingerings in there. So it's all crystal clear in the presentation. And I think that's what people really like about it. But because it's been so popular, it's just let me, I mean, I've leaned into it and done all kinds of other books. So there's like a companion book with it called Cream and Sugar. (laughs) So it's like the the add-on, you know, it's the expansion, which goes into some other uh, other important things that aren't probably aren't as important as what's in morning coffee. So like some more like niche kind of scales, like the harmonic major scale and like things like that, you know, which are, you know, good to know, but like how often do you play that scale? Right. In an actual song or piece of music. So, so I have, I think I have 11 books out now uh, and I have ideas for loads, loads more. So, and I've started doing print versions too, and I make them myself. I do it entirely myself here. Uh, so because I'm doing it all myself, I can sell it for, I can sell them for way less than if you were to just buy the PDF and take it to like a print shop or something where they're going to charge you 30 bucks to print out morning coffee. I, my costs are so low. I can sell the physical copy for like seven bucks. You know, I mean, it, it's just, and I like doing it. It's good. You know? Yeah. I and mean, I've seen some of the pictures on Instagram when I was doing research for the podcast, like just stacks of books. <laughs> that you yeah. Can yeah. It's um, anytime I release a new one, you know, I try, I try to get up a little bit of buzz about it uh, first. Like that last one, the uncaged book, the uncaged system part one. Yeah. When I released that, I, I was completely bombarded with, <laughs> with orders. And for like an entire week, I was, I was, binding books and packing up orders. It was, it was crazy. Yeah. That was an interesting trip to the post office. Yep. <laughs> Amazing. Now I definitely want to ask you about your uncaged book and the approach you take to teaching that, but I just wanted to ask a few more questions about the, the way you are so prolific and how you go about writing so many resources in, you know, what I think is a, a short period of time. Cause I think every now and then I do click on your ad and for me, I just have such a big backlog of resources that people send me for the podcast. I, so I'm just holding off buying things at the moment. I'm like, oh, I really want it, but maybe not today. And I've been on your page, I reckon, a dozen times. And every time I go on there, there's another book that's been added. So it's amazing to see you grow and add resources in such a short period of time. So how do you go about being so prolific or organized? And, and what's the secret sauce there? Like, how am I able to produce them so quickly? <laughs> you mean? I guess it's because, well, I have a, I have a very clear plan for what I want to do for each book. So, you know, there's not a lot of like, well, what could come next? You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have like any uncertainty before I go into and actually sit down and, you know, type the thing out. I make them all in finale, the, the music notation software. Uh, I used to, when I was still at the college, I, I, I taught intro to music tech and like probably half the course was on uh, was teaching how to use that software. So I'm very proficient in it and I'm very fast at using it. But uh, yeah, you know, things like copy and paste and transpose and, you know, cleverly using like edit filters and things like there's all kinds of like ways that you can streamline what you're trying to produce in that program. And I've, I've just gotten really good at it, you know? Yeah. For a bit, I was, you know, putting out one, maybe, I don't know, like once a month or so, it'll probably be a bit before I get my next one out just because I have other projects and things I'm trying to focus on first. But um, yeah, you know, I I try to shoot for like one a month ish, you know, Uh, the uncaged one. That was the first one since maybe around like Christmas time, I think. Yeah, I think that was when I put out the 120 finger style arpeggio studies book. I, I, yeah, I know why it was because, um, in January, that was when I was releasing print versions of all of my books. And some of my books are quite large and they take time to make print versions of. So, so yeah, that was, that was, uh, and there was so much preparation that went into that. Oh my God, so much. <laughs> but when it finally, when I finally, uh, you know, did the email blast, it was, it was cool. You know, it was really exciting. So awesome. And what does a typical day look like for you? 
Uh, well, I have lessons every day. I don't have an off day from teaching currently. I have anywhere from like two to four students that I, that I meet with every day. And in between that, well, I could be working on a new video. That's what I did. Like literally right before we got on, I finished shooting a new video. And I might be editing the video or maybe I'm working on a new book or maybe I'm doing a little practicing. I'm trying to be better about actually practicing <laughs> lately. Uh, I'm also, um, I'm in the middle of mixing uh, my first album. Just a couple of days ago, I had a big mixing session that I was, you know, out of the house for. Maybe I'm doing laundry, you know, like, I mean, it's like, because uh, I mean, I do everything at home, you know, so... And my wife works, you know, she, she works at an office. So, you know, I have to, I, I end up stuck with a lot of housework in between things, you know, but it's good, you know. Oh, and also keeping up with the social media stuff, right? Something I make it, make a point of every day is I get on Facebook and if people have commented on my stuff, I reply, I reply to everybody. That's, I think that's really important to do. And I actually just doing that is, I think I, I attribute that to, you know, a lot of where my current success has come from engaging with the people who like your stuff and like what you have to offer, you know, not like not treating it as a one way communication stream. It's, it's, it goes both ways, you know, and I have people who follow me who, you know, I know their names, you know, I recognize the names in the comments, you know, and I can recall things we've talked about in other comment threads, you know, and it's, and kind of just developing that relationship with, with people is, is so important. And keeping that as one of my priorities is, uh, that was something that's, that was always a priority, even when I started. And I think that's, I think that's a big part of what got things off the ground for me. And in terms of figuring out, I know you sort of mentioned earlier that you just create things for yourself. Is that the case when it comes to all of your offerings or have you kind of strategically thought through, this would be a good resource to create or my audience is asking for this, maybe I should do that next. How do you sort of go about brainstorming ideas and picking what you're going to do next? When people make requests of me, you know, I'd love to see this or I'd love to see that. You should make a video about this or that or you should make this in a book. I don't think I've ever like completely taken that recommendation from somebody. I do sort of, I guess, incorporate the feedback I receive into, into other things, you know? And when I, when I teach things too, you know, I, I try to do it in a way that I would have liked to, to have been presented the information when I was a student, you know, do you, do you know what expert amnesia is? I do personally, but if you want to explain that to our, our listeners, I think it's a very valuable topic to become aware of. Yeah, it's expert amnesia is when somebody who is an expert at something, somebody who is very knowledgeable on a given subject, doesn't remember what it was like to not know the things that they know. And which is why you have guitar teachers who, you know, maybe maybe there's a Let's say you're a student, right? Let's say you're a guitar student and you're, and you're having, you're struggling with something, just some lick or some whatever, you know, uh, and you know, you're looking for advice on how to like get it better, you know, how to improve it. And your teacher says something to you like, well, you just kind of do it. <laughs> right. And you know, it's not hard to realize that that's not very constructive advice, right? How is that supposed to help you? So I try to always remember, you know, what, what was it like to not know the things that I know, you know, how, like now that I do know it, how can I now frame it to somebody who doesn't know it? You know, this, this sort of mentality, this sort of thinking is what goes into my, my teaching in my one-on-one -on -one lessons. It's what goes into the way I explain things in my lesson videos. Um, it's, what goes into deciding what goes in my, my exercise books. That's the thing, you know, it's like trying, trying not to be a, an amnesiac about, the, you know, the, my own learning journey, you know? Yeah. I think that's a really important point you bring up is 
most of us who have had more than one teacher or who have studied with dozens of teachers in order to get really good will figure out that the truly great ones are the ones who can take themselves out of their teaching body and put themselves in the shoes of the student and go, this is what it's like to be a beginner or this is what it's like to have to think through it. Where some of the the better players but the poorer teachers are the ones who just, yeah, totally forget or just bypass to, hey, cool, you want to learn about this scale, you want to learn how to improvise, let's start with, you know, the uh, super Lockerian mode and, and just go for it. And you're just like, yeah, but how? <laughs> um, yeah, right, right. I think one of the best examples of this, I don't know if you've seen it, but I remember getting this Ingve Malmsteen DVD where he taught you a bunch of his licks or his secrets. He's just like, and this is how you do this. And this is how you do this. And it's just like, it's the most amazing yet unhelpful resource that you'll ever come across because it's just him playing everything at top speed once and going, yeah, do that. <laughs> and it's just, yeah, like, 99.9% .9 of people are never going to get to that level in their entire life. And he just like takes it for total, totally takes it for granted, like the, uh, the knowledge and the ability that he has. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally, yeah. Now, how about you tell us a little bit about your uncage system? Because obviously one of the most contentious arguments on all of the internet is the cage system versus anything that's not the cage system. So, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, the uncage system? Yes. So, uh, the title is a joke, first of all. It's it's making fun of the way the caged system is often presented as this revolutionary way of visualizing the neck of the guitar. It, you know, break out of boxes with the caged system. Well, you know, all these things. And the thing is, the caged system, right? It's a, the, what it, if, if you don't listeners at home, if you don't know what the caged system is, right? It's it's basically this idea that there are, if you can take the five open major chord shapes, C, A, G, E, and D, and turn them into movable bar chord shapes all up and down the neck, enabling you to play pretty much any chord, right? And then there's way and then, you know, there's ways to turn them into minor versions and then add sevenths and so on, right? I had never heard of the caged system until I was uh, in grad school, actually. And I had a student who was telling me, yeah, you know, I've been learning the cage system. And I'm like, what, what is that? And he explained it to me and I'm like, oh, so it's just bar chords. Right. And, and uh, the funny thing about it to me is like the idea of these movable chord voicings is not new. Right. Like if you look back at the music, like the early, early six string guitar music from the early 19th century, right? Music from composers like Fernando Sor, uh, Ferdinando Carulli, Mauro Giuliani, all of these, these big names in the early like romantic guitar era, right? Th this idea is clearly present in their music, right? Except they weren't calling it the caged system, <laughs> right? 200 years ago. They, they just understood the way their instrument was laid out and they understood the musical styles and, and idioms of their time, right? And so where does this caged thing come from? I had to do some research to learn this. It's, it's a guy, uh, Keith Allen, I think was his name. And he was a guitar teacher at a place called the Blue Bear School of Music, which I'm not even sure where that is or was. And it's, it's just some like teaching tool that he came up with for his students. And, uh, I believe in, it was 1975 guitar player magazine did a, did like a special on him and his teaching. And they talked about his caged system. And then that was kind of what kicked it off into getting put on posters and getting, uh, sold on the internet ultimately as like a, as like a hack for <laughs> playing any chord anywhere. and. You know, I can't tell you how many students I have worked with who can play a C major chord three ways, right? They can play it the cowboy chord way, right? The open chord way. They can play it as the A-shaped bar chord at the third fret, and they can play it at, as the E-shaped bar chord at the eighth fret, right? And, and the funny thing about that is they're not even using cage to its fullest, right? There should be five, right? 
there should be five voicings. They're only using three of them, you know? And so what it leads to, I think when people learn this is, and not always, but a lot, but often, right. It, it gets to this point where you can, you find your root note of your chord on the E or A string, and then you just plug in the chord shape, right? Which of course, everyone does this, right? I do it, you know, but like, I can also tell you what every single note is in the chord. And I can tell you where the fifth is, the, where the third is, where all the roots are doubled, etc. But I can also play a C major chord in 30 other ways. When I was a sophomore in college, I had to take a class called fretboard harmony. Literally, that was a class that was, that we had to take. And, uh, I remember one of the first homework assignments we had was to go home and come up with as many ways as we could to play a C major triad, a C major chord. And, you know, what's the criteria, right? All you got to do is find any which way you can play the notes C, E, and G on the neck, right? You can double notes if you want, you know, that's fine. But, you know, as many unique voicings as you can come up with. And I came up with probably 25 when I, when I did that. And there's definitely more than that. I think, what, I think something that's important is being able to do just that, to realize any chord in a, in a wide variety of ways. And I guess, I guess it also does kind of depend on like what kind of music you play, right? I mean, if you're, if you're like a, just like a singer songwriter and you, and you, and you, you just play acoustic guitar and sing and, you know, you can, yeah, you can just do all the, the chords down by the, the nut, you know, cause they're, they sound very full and they fill a lot of, you know, sonic space. So they work for that setting. But like, if you're playing with other people, I think, I think if we're playing these big full sit five and six string bar chords all the time, it takes up too much space in the mix. It's a recipe for mud, right? Um, there's, I really don't think there's much reason to be playing those big full bar chords all the time. And I mean, I think back to this time I played a, a pit gig. I played a, um, I played in a production of Mamma Mia, right? And for the, I think it was the second song in the show is like Honey Honey or something. The chords were like F, B flat, F. It's like one and four, you know? And, so there's two guitar players. The other guitar player is playing full F bar chord at the first fret and then B bar, B flat bar chord at the first fret. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that too. Cause otherwise what's the point of having two guitars, right? So I, I did like these little three note voicings way up the neck. So it was almost like ukulele chords. Right. And so when you have the two of us together, it sounds much more full. There's distinct layers to it. Right. So anyway, I'm kind of meandering, but the uncaged book, right? It's kind of inspired by that, that homework assignment that I had. And so it goes through, it, it sort of tosses out the notion of the, of the cage system, you know, this intermediary system between understanding what a triad is just in the generic theory sense and understanding how it lives on the guitar, Right. Cage system is like a subsystem. It's like a middleman, right? To get you between those two things. So it just goes through, yeah, triad, like every triad in all of its inversions. And I do it in closed, like close voicings where all the root third and fifth are as tightly voiced as they can be. And then I do drop two voicings. So it doesn't have any of the caged shapes in it. But one of the things about it that I tell people like in the preface, you know, as you're working through this, make observations about it, Right. Look like be paying attention to where the roots, the thirds, the fifths are in every chord. Be you know pay attention to what the notes are, you know what all the how the intervals all get rearranged when you invert them, you know, and also you'll likely notice that these little tight voicings you you can see them as being part of these larger caged shapes that you're probably already familiar with, right? Like they're extrapolated from the bigger voicings, right? And the goal is not necessarily to get people to stop playing like caged chords, right? It's more to just like broaden your chord voicing literacy, you know? And I even say in it too, like 
I, I use the caged system. Apparently I didn't know it was called the cage system, but I've always done this, right? I mean, I still use the, use that method of visualizing chord shapes on the neck, you know, because when you're in the moment, you can't be thinking about stacking up all your notes, of course, right? You have to, you have to have that stuff ready to plug in and you have to know how these things are all shaped in your, in your hands. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I do, I do still, you know, use the cage system. I don't, I don't write the book to denounce it at all. Right. Cause I think it is valuable, but I think what, I think what happens is people use it and learn it early on. And then it becomes the training wheels that they never take off their bicycle. That's a really great way of explaining it. <laughs> so that's the deal. And there's going to be multiple volumes of it, you know, that I'm planning. The next one, and this isn't set in stone, but I, my, my next volume of it is going to be more about putting chords in context. So like taking, doing like one to five to one in like a ton of different ways and recognizing how those chords relate to each other, you know, physically in your hands when you do it. And doing it with all different common harmonic movements, you know, two five ones and four five ones and um you know one four seven three six two five one, right? Falling fifth progression. That one will probably be a bit more substantial. And then there's gonna be one on seventh chords, you know, which uh just by nature of having more notes in them and <laughs> which will probably it'll probably be a big, bigger book as well. Yeah, eventually. Not sure when I'll get there. But it's on the list. It all sounds awesome. So you've created these resources or potentially you only had one and you started selling and working with that. So how did you go about researching how to sell things online? Did you just chance upon it? Was it really deliberate and intentional in terms of setting up potentially funnels or a web page or Facebook ads? What was your sort of uh, thought process and evolutionary process from your first release up into where you are now? Yeah. Okay. So this actually starts way back to when I posted my first video before I even started doing the, um, selling the books before I even started doing any of this. Uh, I joined this music marketing agency educational platform situation. It's called Indopreneur. You ever heard of it? No, I haven't. You spell that Indo like I N D O. Uh, I N D. E P R E N E U R. It's like, it's like a, a independent entrepreneur is kind of like the contraction, right? So what they do is they teach people how to market their own music, you know? And, you know, a lot of people think marketing is a scam or whatever, right? But it's not complete. It's just completely not true. It's, what they, this whole thing is about like building a business around your music. Right. And, and it's not, it doesn't teach you how to get likes on your videos or how to get a million Spotify streams or get a ton of YouTube subscribers or whatever. Right. It doesn't, that's not what the goal is. You know, like all those things are just vanity, right? That's, those are vanity metrics. The thing that matters is the relationship with the people who follow you, right? It's about you're trying to cultivate a fan base. That's what the whole that's what their whole like mantra is. And they have this like their their like marketing funnel model, whatever you want to call it. They call it the buddy system. And it's all based around like real like marketing psychology things, you know. So I, I joined this like planning to market my own music. And, you know, the more I watched these training videos that they have, I got thinking, you know, this, this could be, these techniques could be used to market like anything, you know, which makes sense, right? Because I mean, it's all, it's all marketing stuff, you know, and it, it, all it is, is just geared towards music specifically. And I thought, you know, what if, what if I were to spin these techniques in a way where I could like find myself, I don't know, a dozen Zoom students, right? I mean, you think about it, like there, there's like uh, like 300 million, I don't even know how many people are on Facebook. Like half the population of the world is on two, Facebook, two right? Two billion or something like that. It's Yeah, right. Yeah. And it's like, surely, you know, if you use these like Facebook marketing techniques that they're, they're talking about, and it's all, it's like all these very clearly 
laid out like step by step things that that they tell you to do. Surely, I could get myself enough students to to like live off of, you know. So I got thinking, you know, okay, so how could you do this, right? And uh, well, I, I sought some advice from some of the people in the group, you know, and you know who like what what kind of like facebook user what kind of audience do you target for this you know so what i did my first ever video that i made was a four and a half ish minute video where i'm talking about how i think fully diminished seventh chords are really cool <laughs> right where they're and just kind of talking about how they're like a symmetrical harmony and you can't invert them and they're always stacked minor thirds. And because of that, you can resolve them four different ways. And that's really neat, right? Um, and just kind of like demonstrating it and explaining, you know, where you can go with them. And if you go back and watch this video, the production quality is awful compared to like my current standards, you know. I've learned a lot over the years of doing this, you know, how to make these things better. But so I made this video. And I made my Facebook page. I already had my website. I've had, I'd had the website for years. I didn't really have a YouTube channel. I didn't have an Instagram for my music specifically, but I made the Facebook page and I posted the video and I created an ad campaign where the goal was simply video views. All I wanted was people to watch this video. And I, and in the video, I never mentioned anything about me being a teacher, right? I'm not, I never said, oh, hey, by the way, I teach guitar lessons over Zoom. Never mentioned it, right? Literally, it's just the content of the video and the subject matter that I, that I went with. In this ad campaign, I ran it towards um, people who are interested in things like like guitar educational periodicals. So like Guitar Player Magazine, Guitar World, you know, things like that. And then like things like jamplay.com and like, you know, these other kind of online uh, like guitar study platforms. And then things like Sweetwater, Guitar Center, Musician's Friend, like the retailers, right? That was my target audience. And I went with people in the United States, Canada, UK, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand. Okay. Because if you go with any countries besides the, besides those, you run the risk of feeding your video to bot farms. And also those are all the major English speaking countries in the world. So that helps too. And I, and I did this and I just ran it as an ad. And I think I was spending $5 a day on this campaign. Just wanted people to watch it. And anybody who commented on it, uh, I would respond to it. And just from that video alone, I got like three students. Never even mentioned that I teach. I had three, like three people ask me, hey, do you teach? You know, you know you're really good at explaining stuff, right? And then for a while, I was doing a new video every week on a new topic, right? And I would keep, I would keep doing this with new videos. I would run them in these, these it's, it's a spin on what Entrepreneur calls a fan finder campaign where you just show them stuff and don't ask for anything, right? And the people who are like foaming at the mouth for more of what you're offering, that's the low-hanging fruit. Those are the people that you want in your ecosystem, right? And so this is why I respond to everybody because I'm trying to nurture them to stay in my sphere, you know? And it's not nefarious, right? It's not like conniving or like tricky or anything. I'm being genuine, you know? Like I'm genuinely happy that these people are engaging with me. And, and then at some point I did a video where I, uh, it was like a different kind of campaign with a different goal where people send me a message. I did a video where I flat out said, Hey, I teach lessons, you know, and I'm recruiting a bunch of students. And then my numbers shot up to like 12 or 15 after I did that, you know, and that was kind of the routine for a while, right? It was just sort of doing more videos every week. And then it got to a point where it's like, I can't keep up with doing videos weekly, you know? It was about like a month before I got married where I was like, I can't keep doing it. I can't. I'm getting married in a month, you know? And then like after that, you know, I had had so much experience, you know, doing these ads, you know, uh, and they were working. I did this morning coffee thing, right? I had the morning coffee book. And I thought, you know, I, I just posted a video of me 
that, that video that you, that you've seen a gazillion times, I just posted it and I said, yeah, here's this book, you know, and posted a link to it. And some people bought it, you know, it was cool. Uh, and then I thought, you know, what if I just run this as an ad to a completely cold audience? Right. I just said, you know, what if just try it? Right. So I ran it to that same audience that I mentioned earlier, you know, the people, the educational stuff and the retailers in the six countries. Right. And I was spending, I don't know, $5 a day on it. And because I sell the book for $5 or no, it was $10 a day. Yeah. If I, if, because I sell the book for $5, if I sell two in a day, I've broken even. Right. And then suddenly uh, I was selling a lot more than that in a day. And I was like, Oh my God, this is crazy. You know? So like these people who have never heard of me are seeing this, this video, they're liking it. You know, they're liking what they're seeing. They buy the book and then they're getting on my email list, right? They're subscribing to my email list after the purchase. So now I've got, now I'm building my audience even more, you know, for a very low cost. So because this ad is not, not only paying for itself, <laughs> right? It's I'm profiting every day. I said, well, dang, I'm going to spend more money on this. Right. Because like, you know, say your, say your revenue is like two and a half times what you're spending. Well, if you're spending $10 a day, you're getting $25 a day. But what if you're spending $100 a day? That's $250 in sales every day. And I was doing that for a while. It's, it's a machine, you know, and, and, it, and it works, you know. And, and the crazy thing, like, I, I was getting more people asking me about lessons as a result of it, you know. I, I, I haven't put out a call for new students in probably eight months at least I'm almost at the point where I'm having a waiting list, you know? And if you have a waiting list, then you're doing good as a teacher, right? As we all know. That's very cool. And what's the, what was your like record number of books sold in a single day? It was when I released the uncaged book. Yeah. I, because at that point, I mean, that's my most recent release. And I, my, I said something to my friend who, who actually works for Entrepreneur. He's, he's like a real marketing geek and he's like really, he, he, he does all his own marketing for his band, but he loves like helping other people with theirs, you know? And I told him like, dude, I'm having my biggest sale day ever. And he said, and I told him where I was at and he said, wow, it sounds like you built up a customer base and then launched a new relevant product. <laughs> Imagine how that works, you know? Um, but I, yeah, that, that release day, I had, um, over a hundred orders in one day and it was, uh, it was about $1,600 just in that day. Not, I mean, that wasn't pure profit, but cause that was like what people paid for shipping and stuff too, which had to come out. But still, that was my most insane day. And, uh, I was like, you know what? I'm going to celebrate. And I'm going to buy a new guitar. Uh, so I bought that. I bought that Dangelico back there that day. So that was pretty exciting. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot of our listeners at home would be just. I'm, I'm sure like the cogs are spinning and they're just planning out their next book and more importantly, which guitar they're going to buy with the profits. <laughs> <laughs> so that's yeah, amazing to hear that something you did you originally gave away oh, essentially for free as a a video has ended up turning into obviously books and profit and all those things like that. Were you sort of, every time you released a new video, did you then promote that uh, with a paid or boosted post? Or was it just a matter of sometimes you kept things running while doing other things uh, organically? Yeah. So, um, I, don't, I don't push video view campaigns on my new videos anymore. Uh, right now, what I do is I have like a paid ad just kind of constantly running. And, and that kind of accumulates more followers and the, you know, the, the audience grows and grows from that. And, and actually it's gotten to the point where I guess the Facebook algorithm likes my stuff enough that it's just organically recommending my videos to people, you know? So it's like, I don't even need to pay money on those, but yeah, you know, like mo I do, I have a lot of organic stuff that's going like this next video I just shot today is going to be just a simple, you know, 
organic thing. And I'm going to let the morning coffee ad keep running and doing its thing. All right, Alex. Well, we're getting near the end of our time here today. Where can our listeners connect with you, find you online, purchase your products, or just keep up to date with what you're doing? Yeah. Okay. So I've got uh, my website is alexrockwellguitar.com. Uh, I'll get you all my social media handles here. Uh, Facebook.com slash Alex Rockwell Music. Uh, Instagram is my, I'm at Alex underscore Rockwell underscore music. And then uh, YouTube handle is the same, Alex Rockwell Music. Fantastic. So we'll be able to post those links to our listeners wherever they're listening to this podcast. So if you want to connect with Alex, make sure you scroll down and uh, click the links that we provide and or just check it out as you're listening. Alex, is there one last bit of advice you would uh, give to our audience of guitar teachers? Whatever, like say if you're doing your books, if you're going to do any kind of books or materials, write stuff that would be valuable to you. You know, don't keep it all as genuine and honest as you can. Don't sell hacks. Don't sell shortcuts because we all know those things don't exist <laughs> and they don't work. <laughs> so, and as you're, if you're just a musician, then play the music you like, like the music you play, be your own favorite guitarist. That's what I always say to people. I think that's some really solid advice there. Alex, on behalf of the Top Music community, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We really appreciate your time and the wealth of knowledge that you've shared. I think our listeners can be inspired by what you've done. And don't be surprised if you get a bunch of people asking about book funnels. And hopefully, because our teachers are creators, entrepreneurs, they do have their own products. Hopefully, they'll be reaching out. And guys, you'll know exactly where to get the links. If everyone else, remember that our our uh, 50th episode is coming up so that if you are interested in getting one of your teaching tips on the podcast, make sure you submit that via the link we'll include wherever you listen to this as well. Guys, thanks once again, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Top Music Guitar Teaching Podcast. Thanks, and until next time, see you later. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.